A'udhu Billah As-Sami Al-Alim Min Ash-Shaytan Al-Ayn Al-Rajim Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful And may God's peace and blessings be upon His Holy Prophet Muhammad And the purified members of His household and progeny Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum Brothers, sisters and respected viewers Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And thank you and welcome to our a series on the topic of the afterlife. Uh, most likely this is going to be the last lecture in this series. Uh, and again, most likely this will also be the last lecture in our bigger series where we explored the entire, um, let's call it classic curriculum of uh, Islamic beliefs, uh, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, understanding his attributes, divine justice, prophethood, imama, and finally, uh, the important topic of the afterlife. So given that, uh, in reality, we were supposed to have a few lectures left to uh, cover uh, a couple of the topics uh, left in the uh, theme of the afterlife, uh, but at the same time, uh, we were hoping to finish right before, inshallah, uh, we are a couple of days away from the holy month of Ramadan. So we're going to, inshallah, today try to wrap up the topic, even though we have a lot to cover. So uh, try to stay with me and stay focused. And if you have any questions, concerns, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, use the chat function. Uh, and for those who are here, please don't hesitate to ask your questions as we're going along. Uh, but the aim is, inshallah, that we uh, wrap up the topic today. So the topic that we left to the very end of this series is the topic of the intercession, shafa'ah. And the manner in which the shafa'ah links to what we have been seeing, especially in the last time that we met, uh, is in the following manner. In the last time we met, we asked an important question. We were trying to see if all along, we've been saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world. And he has made it clear that there are two paths for a human being to follow. Either they are following the path of the right and the truth and the good. And in that case, they end up in heaven and eternal happiness. Or they do not, in which case they seal their, their fate uh, and they end up uh, in eternal unhappiness. The, when we look at this equation, someone may wonder, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entirely neutral in this equation or not? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sit at an equal distance from pushing and pushing the human being to do bad? Or is there incentive and is there motivation and are there drivers subhanahu wa ta'ala has put into the system of creation and drivers that he has put into uh, the legislative system that we refer to as religion that make it very clear that the human being is being pushed a lot more in one direction than the other, the direction of being good and doing good and choosing the good. So we said the question may, to a certain extent, uh, even have the, the manner in which we're asking it may seem disrespectful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, absolute rank and holiness, but this is to simplify the, the question. So when we look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the universe, the creator of the human being, and the one who has legislated religion, is he neutral in this equation in which the human being is a, the agent the main agent determining their future or not. And the short answer that we gave is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created a universe or a system that is neutral. It is not neutral at all. In fact, there are a lot of incentives. All incentives should be pushing the human being to choosing the, the truth, choosing the right, choosing the good, and choosing their own eternal happiness. And we said we can establish this from a number of different angles. We explored the, the most important of them. 
So the first and foremost, we said the very nature of the human being. The human being has been created in a way where they recognize what is good and what is bad, and they naturally lean towards what is good, and they are repulsed from what is bad. This is universal in humanity. Human beings recognize this and lean towards it, and they see it in others, and they see it in themselves. And this is also what gives them their full fulfillment. This is what gives them their happiness. If a human being goes in the other direction and they choose those things that are not the true and the good and the right, there might be material reasons. Usually that's what they are pushing them in that direction, but they know deep down that this is coming at a price and it does not make them happy. Everybody recognizes this. So that's one dimension which we explored and inshallah this one is clear. The second one is the type of guidance that has been given to humanity, which we call religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and again and again establishes and explains that this is for ease. It has been given to human beings because this is what get, this is the easiest, shortest path for the human being to reach their happiness in this world and the next world. And when you go within the details of our own religion, you see this repeated again and again in the Holy Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed this religion to us, has revealed uh, prophethood to us in general and our specific religion and our specific prophethood as uh, a matter of ease, for ease. Yurid Allahu bikumul yusr. The third point that we talked about is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made clear to us the nature of this world and the nature of the afterlife. And we're not going to repeat all the details we said here. We gave four big dimensions, four big pillars. If we look at them, we see that this world completely fails when it is compared to the afterlife and its very nature and the type of pleasure that we can have access to and so on and so forth. And so using our reason and not being fixated on the immediate pleasures, material, physical, pleasures of this world, you can very clearly choose that which is much more rational or much more uh, what should be given more rational priority for a human being. And so again, these are all incentives pushing the human being to do what is right and to choose what is right. And then we talked about a final theme or topic, which is if we look at human beings in general, once they fall into the category of being believers, once you are a believer, we see that you have access to special distinctions, special favors, special merits. And this is only available to you because you have become a believer. And these can be used on both sides to incite you, to motivate you and encourage you to be a believer. And if you are a believer, to be more of a believer because now you have access to these distinctions. And so the ones we talked about the first one was that if you look at the reward and punishment, we said that rewards are multiplied. When you do good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you for the good as though you did better than what you did and that you did more than what you did. So we said in, in terms of both quality and quantity, the reward is always better than if you look at on the opposite side, shortcomings, misdeeds, sins, those are rewarded one for one. One sayyah is one sayyah. One dhanb is one sayyah. But when you come to hasanat, we said, first of all, they are considered better and they are considered more. And the more can be simply more, some verses of the Quran. Some of them said twofold, multiple fold, tenfold, and beyond. And then the second uh, pillar or the second uh, uh, incentive that we talked about specifically for the believers, we said that so long as they have the minimal threshold of belief, one, and two, uh, so long as they have not performed the greater sins, so long as they avoid the greater sins, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commits in the Holy Quran in more than one verse to forgive their smaller sins. And this is mentioned, as we said, explicitly in the Holy Quran, and this is different from saying that you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your smaller sins. The Holy Quran says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will automatically forgive 
your smaller sins if you fall in this category of being a believer and avoiding the greater sins. The third point that we mentioned is that you benefit from the prayers of others. And those others can be, as we saw in the Holy Quran, the angels, the prophets, other believers, and it works whether you are alive or dead, right? So if anyone prays for you or decides to gift you with a reward, they, they recite the Holy Quran, they uh, uh, give charity on your behalf, they send the reward of those acts to you, you receive them without necessarily having done anything for that. And so these are all distinctions for the believers. Now we come to the last one, which we did not really explore. And so this is where we uh, hook the discussion of today to the rest of the discussion, which is intercession. So this becomes the main and final uh, point that we want to cover when it comes to the distinctions of the believers. And when it comes to the topic of the intercession, the first thing to remember is this is a very big topic in theology. We're certainly not going to cover it in a lot of detail in one lecture. That's one. The second point is that we are focusing on the Holy Quran as we have been from the beginning because we want to establish a solid Quranic foundation. Then it will become a lot easier for us to add the narrations to it. So if we were to add the narrations, the topic would really blow out of proportion for what we're trying to cover. That's the second point. Uh, and then uh, the, the way this, this lecture is going to be structured, inshallah, it will be clear, is that we're going to be presenting the notion itself of intercession. What do we mean by it? And then we're going to see what are some of the main objections that we find against the topic of intercession and what are their answers. And there's a lot of them. I try to highlight only the biggest ones and the ones that are worth knowing about uh, and knowing what the quick answers to them are. Uh, and inshallah, with that, we will wrap up the topic. So if someone, as we said from the beginning, maintains the correct belief system and they avoid the sins until they die, so they depart from this world having carried the right belief system and having done right, what we know for sure is that they have avoided eternal punishment. That is no longer in the equation. We know that their smaller sins have been forgiven. And we know that, inshallah, if they have attempted to repent and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness, then their greater sins may also have been forgiven. The issue is that sometimes this is still not sufficient that you still have so many sins or you still have sins that are so big that even though you are carrying the right belief system and some of your smaller or all of your smaller sins have been forgiven and you did ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your greater sins, this may still not be enough for you to secure eternal happiness. So what happens in that case? We have in our narrations that the, the imams tell us at times this is dealt with in this world. So a human being may have to go through difficulties in this world specifically so that by the time they leave this world, they are no longer having to deal with some of their sins and some of their misgivings and shortcomings in this world. And then they are in good shape for the Barzakh world, and they are in good shape for the afterlife. And so sometimes this happens to us directly, and sometimes this happens to us indirectly. It may happen to us through things we care about and family members. And this is all part of what we refer to as the divine providence, right? The engineering of this world, which has to be done uh, in a way where it may impact me without necessarily being only about me. It also impacts others and to each in their own way, okay? So that's first. Things may happen in this world that deal with those sins that are still on our register, on our record, and we have not been able to absolve ourselves from them. That's one. Sometimes this happens after we leave this world or at the moment of dying or in the intermediary world. So this is happening as difficulties at the moment of dying 
and then in the intermediary world. And we talked about that when we talked about Alam al-Barzakh and how sometimes this is where a lot of our sins are dealt with. And inshallah, in that case, for those who go through those difficulties in Alam al-Barzakh, it is so that by the time they reach the afterlife, that they are clean and ready to enter into heaven. Then we still have, at times, people who reach the afterlife and there are still sins that have not been dealt with, that are still on our register, that we have not been able to get cleansed from, neither in this world nor in the intermediary world. And this is where the importance of the topic of intercession comes in. What happens in that case? What happens to those who reach the afterlife and there are still sins that may actually prevent them from even entering heaven? There are still sins that require a punishment. There are still shortcomings. There are rights of others, rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we did not deal with when we were in this world. And though we may have gone through difficulties in this world at the moment of death or in Alam al-Barzakh, this may still not be enough. And we are now in the afterlife where you are without any other means, any other ability to do anything to cleanse yourself of the sins that are still left in your register, still left in your record. So this is where intercession may become the only way out of that situation. The easiest way, and inshallah, what we're going to try to be explaining today, the easiest way to understand the intercession is basically to view it as one of the greatest ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests his mercy in the afterlife. This is one more door that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens to us. Just like these can be escape routes, venues for a human being to get rid of sins and ensure that they end up in heaven, so does the intercession. In fact, the intercession is an even greater form of those venues and those possibilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens for us. Many of our scholars say this is the greatest manifestation of mercy awaiting us in the afterlife. And when we come to, and this is a discussion that we're not going to have right now, but in a lot of ways for us to truly understand the ranks of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, we need to keep this discussion in mind. Because as much as we try to, we never really fully understand their ranks and their positions and their levels in this world. But when we go in the afterlife and we see the type of intercession, the type of role that they play to allow those who follow the truth not to end up in hell and they end up in heaven, this is where you truly understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Holy Prophet and by extension Ahlul Bayt salam, that they are a great mercy to this world. This is if you understand the intercession as being a great mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the greatest form of that intercession will happen through the Holy Prophet and Ahlul Bayt in the afterlife, then you start understanding the role that they play and why they are the sources of divine mercy in this world. And this also extends to the afterlife. The Holy Prophet says, and this is well known, and this is a matter of consensus among all Muslims. Allah, uh, the Holy Prophet says, I have preserved or I have saved my intercession to those who commit the greater sins amongst my nation. Okay, so this already gives us a number of different teachings in those few words from the Holy Prophet, in which he says, first of all, we see how intercession is going to play the biggest role and who is primarily impacted by it. It does not mean that it does not extend to others. It just means that those are the people who will benefit the most from the greater shafa'ah of the Holy Prophet, the intercession of the Holy Prophet. And he says, I am keeping that until the afterlife. Well, I will fully use it. And then we have, if you take the, the narrations and you add them to the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran also has a number of verses that clearly refer to the Holy Prophet's intercession in the afterlife. We have a verse, for instance, from the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Isra, 
and keep vigil or stay up uh, in, in the you know additional uh, uh, prayers devotion for yourself the holy quran tells the holy prophet this is an, a reference to salat al-layl that the holy prophet had to pray uh, why for a part of the night or the small hours of the night that it may be that your Lord will raise you to a praiseworthy station. This is Maqaman Mahmuda. What is this Maqam Mahmud? If you go back to the commentaries of the Holy Quran, all the commentators refer to Al Maqam Al Mahmud as really being the greatest manifestation of the Holy Prophet in the afterlife when he applies his ability to intercede and to take out those who need his help from the divine punishment in the afterlife. And this he attained the Holy Prophet through his worship at night. In any case, so that is one verse from the Holy Quran and the other verse of the Holy Quran, for instance, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, And your Lord will surely give you until you will be pleased. And so there are many narrations here that also explain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow the Holy Prophet to continue interceding to continue to perform the shafa'a until he is happy, until the Holy Prophet is satisfied that he has taken out from the divine punishment everybody he wants to take out from the divine punishment. So the way to understand the intercession is to view it as for someone who is a believer, and we're going to get into the conditions of shafa'a later, for someone who is a believer, they do want to do good, but they come they reach the afterlife still with a lot of sins. This is the last resort. This is the last venue for them that if they are included in the shafa'a of the Holy Prophet and Ahlul Bayt and we're going to talk about other forms of shafa'a, then this is their last hope. This is the only way out left because as we have said again and again, you can't do anything once you reach the afterlife yourself. You're out of options. You can't act. You can't now decide to be good. It's absolutely useless at that. This, of course, does not mean that because I believe that I have the right belief system, I have religion, and I believe in the shafa'a, that I can just rely on the shafa'a and think that that's going to be enough. I can do whatever I want to do. I can live however I want to live because the Holy Prophet and Ahl al-Bayt will come to my rescue and they will apply their shafa'a. And this means that no matter what happens at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to punish me because I will be included in the shafa'a. One point to this is that we have emphasized this. We have said that it is very dangerous to start thinking that you can perform sins and that those sins are not going to impact your beliefs. The moment you embark on the downward spiral of committing sins, it means you are committing to weakening your faith, darkening your heart. And the, the, if this becomes a, uh, a back and forth that you don't get out of, we said this is a downward spiral. There is no way for you to continue performing sins and expecting your faith to remain the same. And we said that, you know, the strongest and most catastrophic version of this is that you simply lose faith or that you leave this world, everybody has some sort of attachment to this world. But because you have a strong faith and you have the correct deeds that go with it, you understand that death is truth. And you understand that you are going now towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you die. And this gives you strength as you go through that. But if this is not in place and you have performed so many sins that that light in your heart is no longer there, as you move towards death, all you have in mind is your attachment to this world. The things from which you start realizing that you're going to be separated. The material things, the worldly things that you loved in this world, because there is no faith, because there's no actions that solidified the faith, you are going to be attached to those things and you're going to realize as you die that you're going to be separated from those things which you loved and which in turn leads a lot of people to hate the process of dying, to hate death, and to hate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
to hate the God that is separating them from those things which they love. And you can imagine anyone who does not have the belief system that we have, why would they avoid this? Why would you embrace death? Why would you be happy to die if you really thought that you are moving away from anything and everything that you loved, which is all resting entirely in this world, and there's nothing good awaiting you in the afterlife? Why would you love dying? Why would you enjoy dying? And this is where we say, yes, we are talking about intercession being useful to someone who believes, but they have sins in the afterlife. But at the same time, this is not enough to say, therefore, you know, be reliant on intercession, inshallah, everything will go well. There is no guarantee. As you continue performing sins in this world, there is no guarantee where your faith will be by the time you die. And often, even before you die, if you continue to immerse yourself in those sins. But in the best case scenario, we'd say at least it took you to the moment of death. But what guarantees that you're going to have the solid faith to at least get you through the moments of death and afterwards? And then the second point related to this is that it may become a barrier from the Holy Prophet himself, those sins. In external appearance, there are people who seem to have done everything right. And we're going to talk about some examples of that a little bit later. But clearly, the Holy Prophet in some narrations, and this is again mentioned in all the sources of Muslims, the Holy Prophet says, when it will be the day of judgment, and I will be at my basin, at my hawd, hawd al-kawthar, I will start seeing that there are people who are initially brought in my direction, and then they are taken away before they reach. And the Holy Prophet says, and I will say, my Lord, these are the people of my ummah. Why are you taking them away? Obviously, they are being taken to punishment. Why are you taking them away? Or are, why are they being taken away? And the answer will come, the Holy Prophet says, you do not know what they did after your death. Which means what? Which means that you can seem to have all the right things. You can seem to have the right belief system. Even if you believe in the intercession of the Holy Prophet, even if you have a lot of good deeds that you have performed, all of this is no guarantee that the intercession is going to work. In this case, clearly the Holy Prophet is saying he can't intercede for those people. Those people are being taken away and they will not reach the Holy Prophet because as we have in our Wayat, if you actually drink from Hawad al-Kawthar, that is it. You are for all of eternity in heaven. You will never go hungry. You will never go thirsty. You will be in a state of bliss and happiness. This basically prepares you to the kind of life that you're going or existence that you're going to have. But those people are not allowed to reach that, which means they are never allowed to reach this state of bliss and happiness and heaven. <clears throat> so what do we mean when we say shafa'a? What does the notion actually mean? Very quickly, in Arabic, when we say shafa'a, it simply means shafa'a is to put two things, to one thing beside the other as a pair. You form a pair with two things. The manner in which it is used in Arabic, the whole Quran uses it too. For instance, when it says a shaf'i wal wat, the shaf' is those that are two. So there are a number of interpretations in the narrations. For instance, we have the two raka'at in Salat al layl a shaf'. That's why they're referred to as a shaf' because it's two of them. There's one raka'ah that has been joined to another, so they make a pair. Whereas al-witr is only one raka'ah. So al-witr is the odd, and the shaf is the even, or the pair. The manner, however, in which it is used, generally speaking in Arabic, and maybe it's just uh, easier to take an example first. Um, let's say there are friends, they are both parents, and then one of the parents notices that the other parent is about to discipline their child. The first friend, the first parent may intercede. In what sense? They ask the second parent not to discipline the child or not to be so hard on them for their own sake. Is it because the child did not do anything wrong? No, they did something wrong and they deserve a punishment. But that parent is going to ask them not to discipline or not to discipline with that much severity, for instance. This may also apply, this is kind of a more social context, cultural context, but it can also apply to situations 
uh, even in law. For instance, you may have someone that should be judged as a criminal, but you may have a police officer or a detective come in or someone who's important in society and they will come in and they will attest, not because this person did not perform the crime, but for instance, because the person is helping them on another case or maybe helping them because they have done a lot of good outside of this specific case. And for that good, there is a part of their sentence that will be dropped. Sometimes the entire sentence is dropped and they, they are dealt with in a different way. Well, these are forms of intercession. This is what we mean when we say shafa'a, this is how we generally understand it. That you have a situation in which someone is supposed to be dealt with in a disciplinary manner, in a punishment manner, but then there's someone who will uh, for their sake ask that this disciplining does not take place. And sometimes you add to it some other factors that this person, for instance, they have done something good. Maybe they don't deserve it fully. If you look at other things, they don't deserve uh, everything that you're about to uh, discipline them with, sentence them with, and so on and so forth. Generally speaking, why is that the case? Why does that work? In the majority of cases, law is law. It may be used for other reasons. It may encourage and it may uh, you know, incite people to do more good and, and, and. And socially speaking, why it may work is because you have a good relationship, a social relationship with someone. You have ties with someone and you don't want those ties to break or weaken. It's your friend and they're asking you, you don't want to reject their ask. You don't want to tell them, you know, so for their sake, you may accept their request and you may say, fine, the discipline will not take place, but only for their sake, only for this time and so on and so forth. But a lot of it has to do with some sort of mutual benefit happening here because of a human relation that is in place. The issue is that, and why is this important and why are we talking about this, is that those who were, especially before the time of Islam, the idea of intercession was there, except that their view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is they view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way, in this anthropomorphic way, as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just like us, a human being with ties. And so that's why they ascribe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as having family members or other gods and divinities who may influence him and he may influence them. And so this is very clearly rejected in the Holy Quran and rejected in Islam. But the idea that there is intercession existed before Islam, it has in fact always existed. And the pagan Arabs, the Arabs right before Islam had all sorts of different ways of understanding how intercession works. But generally speaking, they believed in intercession. And we're gonna come back to that point in a second. One of the main beliefs that they had was that the angels and the jinn perform intercession. In addition to the gods that they had, they specifically, they believed in angels and they believed in jinn and they thought that they have the ability to intercede and to perform shafa'a. So generally speaking, they always relied on them, asked them, made offerings to them so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala avoids, they avoid the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by coming closer and being better and having better relationships with these entities that they believed have an effect and impact on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and the Holy Quran talks about this in many verses, very quickly in Surah Yunus, they worship besides God that which neither causes them any harm nor brings them any benefit. And they say, these, our, these are our intercessors with God. In Surah Yunus, and then again in Surah Zumar, uh, behold unto God belongs the pure religion and those who take guardians apart from him, they say, we do not worship them, save to bring us in nearness closer to God. Okay, and then we also have in Surah Al-An'am, and God will say, now you have come to us alone, just as we created you the first time, and you have left behind that which we had bestowed upon you. We see not with you your intercessors, those that you claimed were partners with God. Okay, and then again, finally, قُلْ لِلَّهِ الشَّفَاعَةُ Jamia in uh, Surah Az-Zumar uh, say to God belongs all intercession, to him belongs sovereignty over the heavens and the earth. We're going to build on this 
Okay? So what, when we read the, these verses from the Holy Quran, what is being denied? And this is where it, it's going to become important to keep, we're trying to understand the notion. How is this different than what the pagans believed? And how is this different from those who want to reject Shafa'a until today? They say there is no Shafa'a. How is this different? When we read these verses of the Holy Quran, what do we feel that the Holy Quran is denying? Is the Holy Quran denying Shafa'a altogether? No. It's denying these types of Shafa'a, where you are ascribing a God with Allah, where you are ascribing someone who has an influence or effect on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the idea of partners, of idols, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having children, having daughters in some verses of the Quran, and we've read these over the, 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 the months, so all of this should be clear to you. As for the topic of Shafa'a itself, when you read these verses, these verses are not denying Shafa'a altogether. They are denying this type of Shafa'a. Shafa'a itself, and we're going to establish this very clearly, Shafa'a itself is a reality in the Holy Quran, very clear. And if you add the narrations to it, it's even clearer. And this is a matter of consensus. This is unanimous in Islam that there is Shafa'a. The only difference, the only details are in how it is applied and the scope of it and how it actually works. Okay, and we're going to come to that when we talk about the objections. If we look at the Holy Quran, we see that it clearly establishes that there is Shafa'a, but it also says that for the Shafa'a to take place, the Quranic Shafa'a, the Islamic Shafa'a, it's not entirely random. There are things that have been put in place that you have to meet. First, there is a divine permission that is required. And then secondly, there are conditions that have to be met for the Shafa'a to work. And this is what makes it different from everything that was said before. Those who believed that Shafa'a is, for instance, from these partners of Allah, these idols and other gods, for instance. So the main point that we need to keep in mind as we move to the next phase is that the Shafa'a of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not because of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's going to lose out or weaken his relationship with any other entity, for instance. It is not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, does not want to hurt the feelings of anyone else, for instance, which is what we have in human beings who intercede on behalf of each other. So the easiest way, the best way, but we're going to present a second way to see it. The best way to understand all of this is to summarize the topic by saying that Shafa'a is, as we said, simply one more way or the main way of the afterlife for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to manifest his mercy, to apply his mercy to human beings who need that last resort to avoid the punishment, the eternal punishment. And so there are more, of course, reasons. I, I, I'm trying to uh, save time without going into all of, the, all of the points, but one thing to keep in mind here is to link it back to the discussion we had. So the link that we created here when we began is we said this is all to explain the incentives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in place for someone to decide, to choose to be a believer and to choose to be good. Well, there is one more incentive here and this incentive is shafa'a. So shafa'a, one easy, simple way to understand it is to say it is simply the last resort or the greatest manifestation of divine mercy in the afterlife. The other way to understand it is to say it's an entire system of laws and principles and conditions, and we're going to go through them now, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in place. It's not random. It's not, you know, as we say, willy-nilly, anyone, just a blanket statement, anyone who believes and does some good, then obviously they're going to be included in intercession. So, yes, there is a precise law that manages, administers, operates everything related to Shafa'a, point one. And point number two is that um, there is a difference between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ruling and people ruling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not benefit. There is no greater benefit that comes to him that he can 
uh, gain anything, as we said, some sort of mutual benefit from uh, you know, agreeing to shafa'a or not. So if we look at the notion of shafa'a, there is two ways to understand it. One of them is the more general shafa'a, and the second one is the restricted technical sense. We're a lot more interested in the second one, but the first one is also important, the general broader sense of shafa'a. So let's mention it quickly, and then we go into the more technical sense of shafa'a. If you look at someone who is good, the reason why they are good could be because of the way, for instance, their parents called them, uh, their parents raised them. It could be because uh, there is someone who associated with a teacher and that teacher had an influence and they made them good. You can even look at a specific act. For instance, going to pray. Here we don't have this, but in the Islamic countries, for instance, if you have the, the adhan call, the reason why these people are moving to go physically moving and going to a mosque, for instance, to pray is because they are hearing someone call them. And so they are reminded of the prayer, for instance. In all of these cases, there is a reason. There is an intermediary between this person and the good that has happened. These are all part of what we refer to as shafa'ah. In all of these cases, there is a shafa'a happening. There is an association. There is a pairing up happening through an intermediary that led you to do the good. And in fact, if you go through the narrations especially, which we don't have time to do, the traditions, you see that the cases we just mentioned, we're using them as generic examples, but these are actually mentioned in the ruwayat as being specific cases of shafa'a. There is very clear explanations in our religion that there is a shafa'a that happens from parents to their children or children to their parents or a teacher to their students or the opposite or to the person who calls to prayer because they are a means for people to do good. To, to the extent that you are a means for people to do good, then you are included in the system of shafa'a. Okay, and so this is an important point to understand. Shafa'a means that there is a pairing up or there's a means or there's an intermediary for someone to do good. And this is going to be seen in the afterlife. Of course, with the conditions that we're gonna mention, that's one. And of course, in addition to that, you can also talk about, for instance, praying for others. When you stand and no one sees you and you pray for a friend who is sick and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal them. Or for instance, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your own sins. In all of these cases, we are talking about the broader, more general sense of shafa'a. Why is this important? Because if we understand this, then a lot of the objections against the shafa'a are going to be removed. Shafa'a simply basically means that you are going through an intermediary that allows you to do the good or to reach the good that you're after. That's it. There is the pairing up that happens that pulls you, that pulls the person who is in trouble out of that trouble and towards what is good for them. Okay? So in all of these cases, as we said, this is a general shafa'a. Now let's talk about the more technical specific shafa'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah says in, in Ayat Al-Kursi without reciting the whole verse, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ This is where we start, we begin with the conditions. The first foremost condition of shafa'a is that it can only happen with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are out of that equation that we're talking about where anyone can just affect Allah however they wish. Shafa'a entirely belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He alone has sovereignty over shafa'a. This is the bottom line. This is the first rule, the first condition. All shafa'a belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. End of story. And we've talked about this when we talked about tawheed, existence, anything that is good in the world. It all belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and then he may choose to give a part of that to someone else, but it still belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's never giving it in the sense that he no longer owns it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah says, who is there who may intercede with him, save by his permission. And we have this in many verses of the Holy Quran. Again and again, Surah Yunus, verse 3, مَا مِنْ شَفِيعٍ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ إِذْنِهِ There is no intercessor save by his permission. In Surah Taha, يَوْمَ إِذَنْ لَا تَنْفَعُ الشَّفَاعَةُ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَرَضِيَ لَهُ قَوْلًا On that day, no intercession shall be of any use or any benefit except for those for whom the Most Merciful has granted permission and whose words are accepted by him. وَلَا تَنْفَعُ الشَّفَاعَةُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا لِمَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ In Surah Sabah, intercession will not avail or be of any benefit except for those for whom he has granted permission. So that's the first condition. Now, in addition, there are characteristics for the shafa'at to work. The first one is who can intercede? That's the first thing. The second one, we're gonna see them. The second one is who can receive the intercession? So there is a divine permission and then characteristics there are characteristics of those who are allowed to intercede. What does the Holy Quran say? For instance, And this is in Surah Al-Zukhruf. And those whom they invoke, so there are people who are praying, who are asking for all these entities to intercede on their behalf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those that they invoke, Besides him, besides Allah, they do not possess any intercession. If we stop here, they, someone might say there is no intercession. But the Quran continues. They, so basically the whole Quran is saying no one possesses, no one has any intercession except one who bears witness in truth while they know. إِلَّا مَنْ شَهِدَ بِالْحَقِّ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ and this, we don't have time to talk about it. This, inshallah, maybe one day becomes a, a, a lecture on its own. What does this actually mean? When the verse says, إِلَّا مَنْ شَهِدَ بِالْحَقِّ Except those who can testify in truth while they know. The Holy Quran is giving us two criteria here for who can intercede. This is the special intercession. This is not just the intercession that you are a means to good. This is the intercession that pulls people out of hell. So who is it? It's those that can testify in truth while they know. So if you really look into the meaning of this, it basically means there are people or there are entities when they testify that this is someone who deserves shafa'ah, they do it in truth. They know fully if this person deserves or not, because they know fully what this person has done. They know fully the rank of this person. So when they, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, shahida bil haq, this is the truth of the afterlife. And we've talked about this again and again, that this is a theme. The afterlife is the world of truth. Everything about the afterlife is about truth, al haq. And we talked about it. So here we have witnesses in the afterlife it's not just like me and you when we see an accident in the street and then the police officer asks us and we testify in truth as in we saw something and we explain what we saw. Because when we talk about shafa'a, we said that there are things like your intentions that are included. The quality of the act that is included. So whoever can intercede has to be someone who has that type of knowledge and who can provide that type of testimony in truth. And so already this limits who can really fall into the category of those who can provide the shafa'a that we're talking about here, okay? So and in any case, this would be befitting if we're talking about shafa'a, if we're talking about someone being pulled out of hell, prevented from going to hell and brought into heaven, then I think it, would, it should go without saying it should be logical and befitting that someone who can intercede and does not mix up 
and distort the system of justice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in place, they would be able to act in truth and based on full knowledge. Okay, so let's leave that at that for now. The second set of characteristics are of those who are allowed to receive the intercession. So once again, this is all to show that intercession is a very clear, precise system of principles and laws. So we have the first condition, the first uh, criteria, which is it requires divine permission. We now have a secondary criteria, which is there are only specific entities, specific creatures who are, who are allowed to intercede. Now, third, there are only specific people who are allowed to receive the intercession. The Holy Quran, for instance, says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدًا سُبْحَانَهُ بَلْ عِبَادٌ مُكْرَمُونَ لَا يَسْبِقُونَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ وَهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِ يَعْمَلُونَ يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ وَلَا يَشْفَعُونَ إِلَّا لِمَنِ ارْتَضَى So the Holy Quran says, and they do not intercede. The Holy Quran was talking about angels, right? They say the merciful has taken a child. Immaculate is he. Rather, they are honored servants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about angels because some Arabs believed before Islam that the angels are the daughters of Allah. They do not precede him in speech. The angels don't say anything without the orders of Allah and they act according to his command. He knows that which is before them and that which is behind them and they intercede not except for one with whom he is content. Except for one with whom he is pleased, he is satisfied. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not satisfied with you, you don't fall under being allowed. You're not eligible to receive shafa'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be pleased enough with you to receive shafa'ah. Again, this is in Surah Al Najm. So, and how many an angel is there in the heavens? whose intercession will avail nothing except after Allah has given permission to whom he pleases, first condition, second condition, and has accepted them. So you need divine acceptance, you need divine satisfaction, pleasure with who you are and what you are bringing to the afterlife for you to be eligible to receive shafa'ah. Does this mean that you're getting there and you're infallible? No, and we talked about that. We said you have to come there with the minimal threshold. We talked about that. We said you have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet, you have to believe in the afterlife. You have to have done enough good that this applies to you. Third characteristics that are mentioned in the Quran, and there's quite a few of them, are the characteristics of those who cannot receive the shafa'ah. One group, for instance, are those who ascribe partners to Allah. And a lot of the verses, we saw them. For instance, when the Holy Quran talks about the mushrikeen, they say, so now we have no intercessors. The, uh, there are people, there's a discussion that happens and there's a few of them in, uh, in the Holy Quran and these all deserve to be studied. These discussions, because they reveal to us how the afterlife works the principles of the afterlife, the laws that are applied and why people end up in certain, uh, in certain situations at the end. Why do they end up in a certain outcome? Why do people end up in heaven? Why do people end up in hell? They are asked and the Holy Quran tells us about that. So in one set of these verses in Surah Al-Najm, the Quran tells us, they ask those who ended up in one part of hell called Saqar, مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ what made you end up in Saqar, in this part of hell? First things, first thing first. قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ First. So, we were not of those, we were not among those who prayed. وَلَمْ نَكُنُ طْعِمُ الْمِسْكِينَ And we were not of those who fed those who needed, need to be fed. وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ حَتَّى أَتَانَ الْيَقِينَ فَمَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ if you fall in these categories, we did not feed the poor, 
We used to indulge in vain falsehood with those who indulge in vain, in vain falsehood. And we used to deny the day of retribution until certainty, most likely death, until certainty came to us. So the intercession of the intercessors will not avail them. So here we have some dangerous categories. Some of these, inshallah, don't apply to any of us. We believe in Allah. We believe in the afterlife. We help those who need help. Inshallah, we do enough of that. But what about the first one? Do we take our prayer seriously? Here there's, I feel, a, a very dangerous warning when the verse begins with لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ and at the end فَمَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ شَفَاعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ This becomes a very important criteria. So we know that shafa'a is not only about beliefs. And we've talked about this as a theme that yes, the most important thing for all of us is beliefs and the intentions behind our actions, but actions in themselves can be very important. We have a narration from Imam Sadiq salam when we, we, we study the life of Imam Sadiq, we're told that his last will, when Imam Sadiq salam was poisoned and he was leaving this world, departing from this world, he asked that all the members of his family be brought together to him so that he states, he tells them his last will. And the words that he said were simply, he told them, be careful and hold on to your prayer because our intercession does not include those who take their prayers lightly. That's it. That was his last will as the Imam Sadiq salam left this world. لَن تَنَالَ شَفَاعَتُنَا مُسْتَخِفًّا بِصَلَاتِهِ So, on the one side, we want to say that it's all about your beliefs. But the Imams are also giving us indications that it's not just about your beliefs. You can't go there and you have completely neglected all of the divine teachings as though you are defying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to try and you have to do your best so that you can be included in the intercession. Otherwise, you fall in the category of those that the Holy Quran is giving us their descriptions, those who are not allowed to receive intercession. And then we have, of course, and this is so one example is the prayer, as we said. I have a hadith here in Tawab al A'mal. Sheikh al Saduq, he says, Inna al Mu'mina la yashfa'u li The believer will be allowed to intercede on behalf of their very close friend. Hameen is someone who is very close. Illa an yakuna nasiba. Unless he, one of, he was one of those who hates the Holy Prophet or Ahl al-Bayt Illa an yakuna nasiba. Okay, why? What else? How, how difficult is it for this person? Walaw anna nasiban shafa'a lahu kulla nabiyin mursal wa malikin muqarrab ma shuffiru. If this person actually is a nasib, they hate the Holy Prophet or they hate Ahl al-Bayt then if every close angel, archangel, and every prophet were to intercede on their behalf, they would not be allowed to intercede. The, the intercession would not work. And so this is where we see that there are very clear categories of people to whom intercession does not work. And this is all to emphasize that there is a very clear system here. Intercession is not a blanket guarantee for anyone. In addition, of course, we have verses of the Holy Quran that talk about hypocrisy and arrogance. Those who will not accept the truth, either because they are munafiqeen, so they pretend everything external, as we said, looks good, but their heart has not submitted to the truth, and they are too arrogant to accept the truth. They will not bend down to the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Munafiqoon, He says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَى وَيَسْتَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَوَّوْ رُؤُوسَهُمْ وَرَأَيْتَهُمْ يَصُدُّونَ وَهُمْ مُسْتَكْبِرُونَ This is the arrogance, right? When it is said to them, come to the messenger of God so that he can ask forgiveness for you, they twist their heads. And you see them turning away in arrogance. It is the same for them, whether you ask forgiveness for them or you do not ask forgiveness for them. God will never forgive them. Truly, God guides not the transgressing people. And then we have a narration that to me goes with this. 
The Holy Prophet says, Man lam So this to me is another category. You may do all the good in the world. You may believe in all the right things and do the right things. And you go there, you read, don't believe in the intercession of the Holy Prophet. You do not understand the rank of the Holy Prophet and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him intercession. So the Holy Prophet says, As for the one who does not believe in my intercession, my intercession. Or because La Analahu Allah can be understood in two ways. God will never allow him. May God never allow him. But both have the same outcome. Both mean this person is not included. So not believing in the intercession of the Holy Prophet means you don't have access to the intercession of the Holy Prophet. So in summary, until now, intercession is a reality. This is a matter of consensus in all Islamic literature, in all Islamic schools. It is only through God's permission. There are conditions that have to be met. The conditions are that there are only certain entities, certain creatures who are allowed to intercede. There are only certain people who are allowed to receive intercession. And there are categories of people. In other words, there are categories of beliefs and actions that will prevent someone from reaching intercession. So if all of this is clear, now we go into the second part, which is what may be some of the big Objections against intercession. And I have seven of them, and I'll do them quickly. And there are a lot more than these, but these are the ones that you may encounter and that are worth talking about. The first one. The first objection against intercession is that they say, those who object, they say, the Holy Quran says intercession in the afterlife. How? They go to verses of the Holy Quran. For example, there is a verse that says, and guard yourselves against a day when no soul shall avail another, nor shall intercession be accepted from it, nor shall ransom be taken from it, nor shall they be helped. There's two verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, 48 and 123. Both say there is no shafa'ah on that. So if you have verses in the Quran that clearly say there will be no shafa'ah in the afterlife, what's your answer? Why do you say there is shafa'ah? Very quickly. The verses that talk about, and inshallah for all of these objections, to a certain extent, we've already answered them throughout the, the lecture, okay? But let's, let's uh, highlight the answers to these. The verses that say there is no shafa'ah, they fall in different categories. I've looked at all of the verses and I, I put them in these categories. There's a category of verses that talk about other partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is no shafa'ah because God has no partners and you are asking the partner of God to perform the shafa'ah. So there is going to be a denial of that shafa'ah. That's one. Two, there is no shafa'ah of those who do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who do not believe in the afterlife, who do not believe in prophethood, who do not believe in this specific prophet. So don't expect and don't hope to receive shafa'ah if you don't believe in the holy prophet. It's not because there is no shafa'ah, but your type of belief disqualifies you from receiving that shafa'ah. If you don't believe in the afterlife, as the uh, the verses that we recited uh, about the people who are in Saqqar, right? It says we do not believe in the day of retribution. They say there is no Yawm al-Din. فَلَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ شَافِعِينَ You don't believe in certain things, this disqualifies you. This is the second category, third category. There are verses that clearly talk about the hypocrites. If you're a munafiq, you don't really have the true belief, then the Quran says, and there will be no shafa'ah for you. And then finally, there is this type of verse, especially in Surah Al-Baqarah, and especially this. The beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah talks about two categories of people a lot. 
It talks about al-munafiqeen and it talks about the Jews who lived at the time of the Holy Prophet. This verse talks about them. Why? Because of their belief. Their belief in general and their belief about shafa'a. This verse is not talking about there is no shafa'a. Those Jews believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen them. And they are the descendants of the chosen people who were all prophets. And now they are alive in the time of the Holy Prophet. And they would tell the Holy Prophet, in the worst case scenario, we are going to be rescued, saved, because of our lineage. Because we are the descendants of the prophets of Bani Israel, we are going to automatically receive their intercession. And we will never, and as we have in other verses in that same category in Surah Al-Baqarah, we will never go to hell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never take us to hell. No matter what happens, we are the chosen people and we are the descendants of the prophets. And so they will intercede. So the Holy Quran is denying this. This belief that you are going to receive intercession just because you are the, just because you are the descendants of those prophets. So these are categories of verses that, yes, you may find some verses of the Holy Quran talking about there is no intercession in the afterlife. Generally speaking, they fall into one of these categories. There is nothing else. All the other verses, they say there is shafa'a, as we saw. But there are conditions and there are exceptions. This doesn't mean there is no shafa'a. There is shafa'a unless you fall in these categories. Okay? And secondly, this is simply a general rule. Intercession is a reality. And we said it requires divine permission and there are conditions and characteristics of people who have to meet those conditions. And then when you look at other verses of the Holy Quran, you see that they are not denying, as we said, that there is shafa'a. In Surah Al-Baqarah, when it says, Man indahu illa Who is there who may intercede with him, save by his permission? It means there is shafa'a, but it requires God's permission. In Surah Taha, on that day, no intercession shall avail, except for those for those whom the Most Merciful has granted permission, and so on and so forth. So we saw these verses. The second objection. The second objection is that they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supposed to act independently and not be impacted by anything else, by anyone else. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that someone will go to hell or someone will go to heaven. No one outside of him should come and be able to change this judgment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why shafa'a goes against tawheed. That's how it's presented. The divine power, the divine might, the divine decision, and so on and so forth. First of all, this is not the only way to view it. So if you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, based on the judgment of someone, this person should go to hell, but then there's intercession that happens, and this person will no longer go to hell. It's the only explanation that they affected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, there is another way to understand this. As a first rebuttal, someone may say that this is also the case if you look at something like, for instance, repentance. If someone has done bad, and then they repent, and we're going to come back because there's one dimension of this that doesn't work here. We're going to come back to it later. And then they repent. Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed his mind? Is this how it needs to be viewed? That something from outside of Allah has affected him? No. The way to understand it is to understand that there's a system put in place. And if something happens, if there is a action, there's a reaction. The shafa'a falls under this. There's a system with principles, with laws of causality, let's put it. The way to understand this one, they say there's a difference between the agency of the agent and the ability to receive of the receiver. Okay, so this is a, a topic in Islamic philosophy that we're gonna simplify but it opens the door to this and a lot of other things. Because this applies to all the topics related to Tawheed in this world. 
It's not, it goes beyond just shafa'ah as an objection. The objection that, is there actually something impacting God's decision? And this could apply to all sorts of other areas. In short, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change. What changed is you. What changed is the receiver. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, as they say to use their terminology, they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emanating. But it doesn't mean that you can receive. If there's a signal here, but you don't have the right tool to receive that signal, you don't receive that signal. What happens is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes how he's dealing with you. What happens is you are changing your ability to receive or not receive the mercy. To receive or not to receive the divine effect. Shafa'a is exactly in the same way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change. In their terminology, the, the proper term in philosophy, they say fa'iliyat al-fa'il. Fa'iliyat al-fa'il, the agency of the actor, the agent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the fa'il, does not change. Don't look on the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see what changed. If suddenly you go from going to hell and then going to heaven, what changed is your status. It's the qabiliyat al-qabil. It's the one receiving the divine mercy. Can you now receive the divine mercy or not? When the shafa'ah has been applied to you, and we're going to combine it with the next objections, the answer will come. You have basically been included in a cause and effect relationship. There's a system, and you were meeting the criteria of that system. So keep that in mind. Objection three. Objection three is that they say, are the, those who are interceding, are they more merciful than God? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose and judged that someone is going to go to hell, then you're telling me that someone who is not God is going to come and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take those people out of hell because they are more merciful than God? How else can you explain it? So this is the objection. Are those who intercede more merciful, sympathizing more, being more compassionate, more beneficent to the creatures than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that they intercede on the, in the afterlife and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to punish those people? Are they more merciful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Answer. The, in short, the quick answer is anything and everything that we find in the system of existence, including the afterlife, comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this applies to this life, and it applies to the afterlife. If you see mercy in this world, if you see compassion in this world, you have to know that this was put in there by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are forms, these are manifestations of divine mercy, but they are simply going through these creatures. So they may be the angels, they may be prophets, they may be our prophet, they may be the Holy Quran, they may be Ahlul Bayt. But this, the origin of this mercy is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one. Second point related to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said and made it clear that anything that happens in this world is actually happening through Allah. And this is not limited to mercy. If you look at anything that happens in the world, it's happening through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We talked about this when we talked about divine power, divine wisdom, divine justice, and the attributes of Allah. The intercession itself is no different. The shafa'a itself is no different than anything else that happens. If you see, for instance, life in this world, if you see power in this world, if you see mercy, compassion in this world, you have to know that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acting. But he does not act directly. He's acting through a means. Shafa'a is no different. Someone can ask. Where he is not acting directly. Where things that happen in this world, if you remember, when we talked about angels, for instance, we said they are the ones who administer all the affairs of the world. Why? Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do it himself directly? 
Why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly guide a, every single human being themselves? Why does he go through other human beings, through angels, other human beings who are prophets and scriptures that reach people? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose that path? But that's different. That's a different question. The why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this system is a different question than saying it is not Allah who's doing it. Let's all agree that this is all, all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's act. All of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's action. But he chose to do it this way. And then this brings us back to the divine attributes of divine wisdom, the type of world that he wanted to create, because this is the most befitting world for the intentions for which he created us and created everything. Okay, and so there's a lot of answers that we can give to all of this in general. And we talked about that a lot when we talked about divine justice. And we can talk specifically about, we can talk specifically about intercession. Why does intercession have to go through this way? And we can give quick answers to these, but the full answer, we can never give it. This is simply the type of system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to create. But this is not to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the one acting. But he decided that his act goes through intermediaries and means. As Imam al-Sadiq says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make things go through their causes. There's always a cause through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acts. And of course, this applies to the afterlife too. There's a lot of points that uh, we can cover here, but I'm trying to wrap it up. So one of these, for instance, could be just looking at the afterlife. We could say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you or makes you feel the reward and the punishment of the afterlife directly. But he doesn't. He says there is hell and there is heaven. And in heaven, there are rivers and there are trees and there are houses. And there are maidens and there are and there are. Why? All of these are intermediaries and means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need to go through these. But he does. And the same thing can be said as we said about this world. And so the easy answers when we talk about this is first, very quickly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to proliferate, wants to multiply the means of his mercy. The shafa'a is one such example. And this is not the time for this discussion, as we said, but if you keep in mind the discussion that, that we hinted to with the general shafa'a, you see that shafa'a is not limited to X, Y, Z people. Shafa'a can also include the Holy Quran and can also include your own bodily organs and can also include the place where you worship and can also include and can also include and can also include. Why? So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies or in fact makes infinite the means of his mercy, how his mercy can reach you. Okay, so that's one answer. And the shafa'a, as we said, of Ahlul Bayt and the Holy Prophet is the greatest manifestation of this, but it is not the only one. That's one. The second is, and we'll stop here. There's other answers we can give, but we'll stop at this one. The second is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used this as a system to show you the true merit of some creatures. To really appreciate and understand who this person is, you will not see it in this world. But if you go in the afterlife, with everything happening, where things are truly based on their merit and their value, and then you see a creature, whether it's an angel or a prophet or an imam or a Quran or a salah, coming and performing intercession, then you truly understand the rank and the position and the merit of that creature. So this is one more means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reestablish the status, the merit, the value, the position, the rank of some creatures. And this is the type of world we have and the type of world that we have in the afterlife too. Okay? So the rest I think we can skip over. The fourth objection. And I'll go a little bit faster here. We can, uh, those were a little bit more complicated. The fourth objection is that they say intercession contradicts divine justice. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's say he chose someone. This person was 
apparently doing good, but a lot of bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided, judged that this person is going to go to hell. And then intercession happens. And now this person is supposed to go to heaven. Either we say this person was really supposed to go to heaven because intercession is good, in which case Allah was not wise and just in making them go to hell first. And then intercession kicking in. Or the opposite. You say that intercession is against divine justice and divine wisdom. Because it is the judgment of God that was wise and just. And then you have intercession coming and messing up divine justice that says this person ought to go to hell. So both of them, the outcome is intercession goes against divine justice and divine wisdom. It contradicts the divine judgment. The answer. We established as a general rule that every act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be wise and just. So either we agree on this or not. If we agree on this, then we come to this specific state. Is it contradictory to say that both judgment and both punishment and reward are wise and just? Is it contradictory? No, it is not contradictory. How? Because each one of them looks at a specific thing. There are specific things that mean you're supposed to be punished, and there are specific things, conditions, exceptions, and so on and so forth, that mean that the forgiveness should be applied to you. Either this one works for you, which means you are entitled to intercession, which, is, which has its own laws and rules, or they don't. This doesn't contradict. It is part of the greater order. You have the great order where sin equals punishment and good equals reward. But within that order, you also have the escape routes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in. The smaller systems that if you meet them, then they apply to you. And intercession, as we said, is one of these systems. This is why we spend so much time establishing the conditions so that it doesn't look like it's random. If you meet, you are eligible for intercession, then the criteria automatically apply to you. And there's no going against divine wisdom and divine justice. In fact, divine wisdom and justice have created this system with intercession in it so that it applies to you. Okay? And there's a lot that we can say here. I'm, I have to go very quickly. So, you know, even if you look at conventions, like laws that we have in our societies, we see that there are certain situations where you have a certain law in place and then the social conditions change. Let's say two centuries later, there's a new law put in place. Well, which one was just and which one was fair? Maybe both were. They change depending on the situation around it. And when we talked about prophethood, we also talked about this. We said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may send a set of teachings to a group of human beings and then later he may send another set of teachings. Is it because the first ones were wrong and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is changing them to correct them? No. Is it necessarily because every teaching was modified? And no. The conditions changed and they required a new set of teachings. Not because those were wrong. Those were right for those conditions. And these ones are right for these conditions. The same thing if you apply certain heat to and you do certain processes to, to grapes, they become vinegar. You do other things to them, they become alcohol, wine. This one you're allowed to drink, this one you're not allowed to drink. What changed? Well, there's something that changed. There is something that changes, that means the law may change. The conditions, the circumstances change, requiring a different outcome. Okay, so inshallah, this one is clear. In the same sense, this is how when intercession kicks in, it means you were eligible for it and it is part of the greater plan. The fifth objection is that it implies a divine change in the rules. And the Quran says Allah does not change his rules. What's the answer? We are saying, so this one should be clear by now. We are saying that intercession is part of those rules. It is not random. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you meet criteria A, B, C, and D, and you avoid certain 
things that may lead to certain situations, for instance, hypocrisy, uh, you know, uh, underestimating prayer, fighting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a holy, pro holy prophet, so on and so forth. You avoid these and you meet the criteria, then these are the conditions which mean that you are falling under the order of the law of intercession, just like the rest. The sixth objection is that they say intercession, believing in intercession encourages sinning. If I know that there is intercession, it means that I will sin. So we're basically telling people you can do whatever you want and this messes up this life, their life here and their life in the afterlife. So this is an encouragement of sinning in this world and therefore people ending up in hellfire. Answer. First of all, as we said, there are no guarantees. And we can give a whole lecture just on this. There are no guarantees. There is no one who can say, I meet the criteria and I will leave this world, especially someone who is sinning, because this is who this is applying to, applied to, who is performing a sin and they say, I have a guarantee, blanket statement that I will be included in the intercession of the Holy Prophet and the Imams, for instance. There is no such guarantee. We don't even have a guarantee that we will leave this world with the proper faith, right? So there are no guarantees. That's one. Second point. We also saw that there are conditions for intercession to work. Divine permission, that Allah is happy with you, that there are people who agree that you deserve intercession in the afterlife and that you don't fall in the other categories. That's two. Three. The counter argument to all of this is that if you say there is no intercession, you've created a scenario of hopelessness. It means that you have performed so many sins in this world that you think the door is completely shut. There is no way out for you. You think that you have so many sins and so many shortcomings that there is no way for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever going to take you out of eternal punishment. And as we said, this is considered a cardinal sin in Islam. And Shafa'a opens a door out of that. That you know that no matter how bad you have been, there is a way out. And you also know that, as we said, no matter how good you are, there is no guarantee. And all the great teachers and masters of ethics and spirituality and all of our spiritual teachings and our religion emphasize this point. The ability to find the balance between hope on one side and not feeling secure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the over-reliance, not feeling secure that Allah will never punish me. Both of these are considered extreme positions. In one verse, we have, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, uh, أَفَأَمِنُوا مَكْرَ اللَّهِ فَلَا يَأْمَنُوا مَكْرَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ So uh, do they then feel secure from God's plotting or planning? No one feel secure from God's planning, except those who are losers. That's on over-reliance. On the other side, وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ In Surah Yusuf, Ya'qub tells his sons, السلام, he tells them, لَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ Don't give up in your hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only a people who are disbelievers who give up their hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then finally, they say that intercession contradicts individual responsibility. So they say that a human being, the Holy Quran says, is the only person who is responsible of their own fate. They said, Al insani illa ma sa. Whatever you endeavored, that is what's given to you in the afterlife. So, how does Shafa'a work? First, there is directly and indirectly. Directly, you have performed fasting and prayers and so on and so forth. But what about indirectly? Indirectly, it doesn't mean that you have done absolutely nothing. It means that you have come having done a lot of good things, except that those good things may be lacking. The seeds are there. The minimal threshold is there. You have the beliefs and you have the actions, but they may not be complete. It doesn't mean that you have come with absolutely nothing. The, when we say that, for instance, there are people who are guiding us in this world. Does it mean that I was able to do everything on my own? No, I received guidance through them, guidance of a prophet, 
guidance of a scholar. And they helped me. And that guidance came not entirely only out of my own action, but the action of others that pulled me out. This is a type of shafa'a. To say that I am only responsible, I'm the only one responsible for my faith, yes and no. You do have to make those actions. You have to put in the initial steps that lead to the shafa'a. And if you don't, you're not going to get the shafa'a. If you do, then no one can say that you haven't done anything to get that shafa'a. You were responsible to receive that shafa'a that you received. Okay? And of course, the, the last point that I wanted to mention here was it may actually be very arrogant for anyone to think that they receive any good in the afterlife, especially if they think that they're going to reach all the way to heaven, for instance, only based on their own action and their own effort and their own striving and struggles. We do not believe in that. This would be extremely, extremely arrogant on our part to think that there's anyone who is reaching heaven simply based on you know, a fair and square judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why for all of us, the most we can aspire to is that we will be included in shafa'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to deal with people based on what they actually are doing in this world, he doesn't say that none of them would be left. He says no creature. There would be no creature left on this planet. There's ajal and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pushes that to the afterlife so he doesn't, which tells us what? Which tells us that if you look overall at the actions of a human being, they're not enough. They're not sufficient. You need more. You need an extra dose of mercy or compassion that pulls you out and makes you, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worthy of eternal happiness, jannah, and you know, living the blissful existence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised. So inshallah, we don't fall into these mistakes. There's a lot more that we can say, but it is prayer time, so we'll stop here inshallah. And with this, alhamdulillah, we have finished the topic of the intercession, the big series on the afterlife and the bigger series on the belief system. And inshallah, we continue with a new belief, a uh, new uh, series uh, outside of the belief system after the month of the holy month of Ramadan. During the month of Ramadan, we will continue with uh, some lectures that are more uh, general and most likely relevant and spiritual uh, during the uh, our general weekly uh, gatherings. Uh, if there are any questions, concerns, please don't hesitate to write them on the group uh, or write them uh, online and we will get to them inshallah. And uh, please keep me in your prayers. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi